Good evening, this is Pastor Mike from Levittsburg Baptist Church, and I want to thank you for joining us for our uh, Wednesday night message uh, for July, uh, November 25th, 2020. And since it is the night before Thanksgiving, I want to bring a message uh, for on thankfulness in 2020. Uh, you know, it's uh, been a really rough year, hasn't it? We've had coronavirus, COVID-19 outbreaks. Uh, things are worse now than they have been, uh, and even made worse uh, by the media coverage. Uh, so uh, we've had uh, riots and civil unrest because of uh, police uh, abuse of power and perceived police abuse of power. Uh, the police have been given a, a really bad black eye because of uh, the wrong actions of a, a few people and being painted with a broad brush uh, because there are some bad police officers, even though the vast majority of police officers are good police officers trying to do the best they can. And do they make mistakes? Yes. Uh, but they try hard. They try to do the right thing. And yet uh, a few bad officers are really making them look bad and and giving them a bad uh, reputation. We've had uh, we've had a political season that has been really rough and divisive, and and uh, quite frankly, uh, embarrassing uh, the way uh, things have gone and the way people are behaving. And it's starting to settle down now, but still, um, some people got what they wanted, some people didn't, and. Every election year, it seems more and more uh, people who lose are taking it worse and worse and and showing a lack of grace and a lack of uh, maturity. We uh, People have had deaths in their families. Uh, uh, people have been uh, injured and sick and, and just... Uh, the you know there have been shutdowns and people stay, had to stay at home and uh, maybe lost their jobs temporarily or even permanently. Uh, uh, some people uh, had to go to work every day, uh, even amidst the virus and exposing themselves to this virus that uh, the media is making out to be uh, the worst thing that's ever happened as far as uh, contagions go, and yet. Uh, God calls us to be thankful. And how do we express that gratitude? How can we be thankful when things are as bad as they are? Well, I want to look at just three passages on Thanksgiving. They're all familiar to you, I'm sure. If you've been under my ministry for any period of time, you've heard me uh, say these things often and and but it's something that really needs to be reinforced especially in the midst of bad times so first of all I'd like you to turn to Colossians chapter 3 verses 16 and 17 and here we see uh, that thankfulness really is a result of knowing God and knowing God intimately it says let the word of Christ dwell in you richly this is speaking of intimate knowledge of God, intimate knowledge of Jesus Christ, letting it grow in you richly. Uh, his commands, his promises, his, uh, the way he lived his life, the teachings that he, he gave us, and not just as Jesus Christ in the New Testament, but uh, throughout the entire entirety of Scripture. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. He says, listen, we need to teach one another thankfulness. We need to encourage one another, admonish one another, teach one another to be thankful, uh, to have this wisdom where as we sing these psalms, as we sing these hymns, as we sing these spiritual thongs, songs, we have this thankfulness that springs out of our heart. And this thankfulness that springs out of our heart really comes from that intimate knowledge having intimacy with God. He says, And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, 
giving thanks to God the Father through him. You know, as we understand that thankfulness springs from our heart and that, that what comes in our heart, what's springing out of our heart is whatever we put into it. So we should be putting knowledge of God into it. We should be getting to God, know God better, know Jesus Christ better, know the Holy Spirit better. Uh, that this should affect how we do things. This should affect our actions. That whatever we do in word or deed, whatever we say, needs to be as a result of what is in our heart, this gratitude in our heart. And so when we think about that, think, think of what our life would be like if we didn't say anything that did not spring out of an attitude of gratitude to Jesus Christ for who he is and what he's done. If, if we spoke out of that gratitude, there are so many things that wouldn't be said. So many things that are said that sh wouldn't be said and that shouldn't be said. Think about, you know, people who uh, go out and use profanity. It wouldn't happen if they were thankful, if they heart had hearts that were gr of gratitude towards God. Uh, think about the gossip that goes on. And it happens not just in the world, but in the church, which is to our eternal shame that that in the church that should be a safe haven for believers there's so much gossip that goes on and and that gratitude if we had that spring out of our hearts we wouldn't be gossiping we would be representing jesus christ in what we say and uh, whatever we do in word or deed whatever whatever we do the actions that we take that means that whatever we do, we do it in the name of Jesus Christ. That means that what we do, we do as a representative of Jesus Christ. That means that we do everything with excellence. Now, when I say excellence, I don't mean that you have to be the best at everything that you do. Uh, very few people are the best at anything. Uh, but what it means is you need to be the best that God created you to be. That means that when you go to work, whatever job it is, whether you're the president of the United States or, or a person on the side of the road picking up trash, that you are a representative of Jesus Christ and as such you should be doing that job with the same level of commitment, the same level of excellence in personal effort that Jesus Christ would do it. And when we look at Jesus Christ and what he did, he did everything wholeheartedly. He did it uh, because he understood he was representing God the Father. And so he did everything with excellence. And so that's what we should do. We should do everything with excellence to the best of our ability, to the best ability that God has given us, that's how we should do the, the work that we do. If we do that, boy, you're, we're going to have good reputations at work. We're going to have good reputations in our neighborhood, in our communities. But not only that, it says whatever you do, you know, sometimes we think of things as being trivial. Things at work, sometimes we think of being trivial, but then there are other things too, like our leisure activities. Whatever you do for a leisure activity, you should seek to do it with excellence. You know, people sometimes say, well, Mike, you're just so competitive. And, and, and you just have to win. It's like, I don't have to win. Do I like winning? Yes. But what I do is I do it to the best of my ability. When I, play, when I played games with my kids, I did not let my children win except when they were the very, very youngest they were. Uh, you know, little games, it, when I'm playing with a three or four year old, you know, I'm not going to uh, just wipe the board with them, so to speak. But, you know, what I did is, is I played at a level that forced them to feel challenged so that they would improve. They, my children did not grow up thinking that I was going to give them things because they were my children. That I was going to just let them win at games because they were my children. They learned that if they wanted to win, 
They had to play the game with excellence and do it to the best of their ability. I can tell you that some of my kids are pretty good game players. They're pretty strategic. And I like to play strategy games. So uh, some of them are pretty good and, and uh, have beaten me their fair share of times. And But whatever we do, you know, there's nothing trivial in our lives that we shouldn't do with excellence. Um, you know, you've heard it said, if a job's worth doing, it's worth doing right. And may I say this, that if a job's not worth doing right, it's not worth doing at all. It should be done with excellence. Because we are representatives of Jesus Christ. We are telling the world, this is how Jesus Christ would do this. And when we, and, and, and that excellence should be something that doesn't come from, a, a, you know, being forced to do it. But it should come because we are grateful to God, grateful for Jesus Christ, for who he is and what he's done for us. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18 and 19, again, another familiar passage. It really explains to us that thankfulness is always necessary. It doesn't matter what's going on. We have to be thankful. We are required as Christians to be thankful. It says, give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Now this is in the context of a whole bunch of different commands. And sometimes we think, well, those commands are just kind of, you know, a list of things and they don't really relate to each other. But they really do. And I find it interesting when, if you have a Bible that puts things in paragraphs, a lot of par Bibles that put things in paragraphs will include both of these verses in the same paragraph. Give thanks in all circumstances. So whatever circumstances you're in, you need to give thanks. You need to be grateful. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So that's God's will. God's will is that we have hearts of gratitude to him. to Not just in the good times, but in the bad times as well. well. Not just when things are going easy, but when things are going rough as well. And then it immediately follows up with this sentence. Do not quench the spirit. And I really believe that, you know, sometimes we think of quenching the spirit as something, some sin we do, some, some action we take that is sinful. Uh, if, you know, well, if, if you're bitter, you're going to quench the spirit. If, if, you know, you do this thing, you're going to quench the spirit. If you do that thing, you're going to quench the spirit. But really, when you look at this, you can really tie a lack of gratitude, a lack of thankfulness to God to the Spirit of God being quenched in your life. You wonder why you don't have the power of God in your life. Let me ask you this. How thankful are you to God in every circumstance? Are you only thankful to Him in the good circumstances? Are you thankful to Him in the bad circumstances? Are you praising Him when things are bad as much as you praise Him when things are good? Are you even praising God when things are good? Are you giving testimony of what God has done in your life, even uh, in both the good times and the bad times? Or, or do, does somebody have to drag it out of you, what God's done in your life? You know, we need to be very public in our testimonies and public in our gratitude to God. Our faith is not a private faith. It is very personal but it is not private. God never intended to be private. He wants us to be public and to be grateful and thankful and to praise him so everyone can see. And we cannot properly praise God if we are not thankful to him. Any praise we have when we have hearts of ingratitude is just going to be surface talk. I mean, we can, be, we can thank God, we can praise him, but if our heart is not in it, if we are not really thankful, it's like, it's just an echo that bounces off the ceiling. It's not, it's not really praise to God. It's just arbitrary. And so, you know, thanks, giving thanks in all circumstances is God's will in our lives. And if we do that, we will avoid quenching the spirit. And then finally, in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21, we see that thankfulness really is a command of God. It says, therefore, 
Do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. He said, don't be foolish. You need to get this. You need to really grasp this. You need to not just know this, but you need to understand what God's will is. And it says, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. He says, I, I don't, you're not supposed to get drunk, but you're supposed to be filled with the Spirit. When you get drunk, the alcohol kind of takes control of you. And by taking control of you, what I mean, it removes all restraints from you, so that you do whatever's in your heart to do. Unfortunately for us, the Bible tells us that the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? When we get drunk, we just allow the evil in our own hearts to have run rampant. It says, but, to be, but be filled with the Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit have control of your life. And when we do that, it says, address it. these are the signs of that, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So we're going to do talk to each other in songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. When we sing praises to God, when we see the, sing the songs that we sing, whether they're hymns or worship songs or spirituals, when we sing those songs, we're not singing just singing praise to God, but we are addressing each other and telling each other, this is, this is my God. The God who created me, the God who created all the world, the God who is sovereign over all circumstances, over all things, He's the one that I am praising. He's the one that I am grateful to. He says, making melody in the Lord with your heart. And I want you to really grasp that, that, that this melody that we make, I know a lot of people, I'm not the world's greatest singer. I'm not even remotely a good singer. And yet, when I'm singing to God, when I'm singing in church, I try to sing out. And it's not because I'm a great singer, because I'm not. It's because God tells me to make a joyful noise to, unto the Lord. God tells me that this melody that comes out of, should be flowing out of my heart. And whatever is in my heart needs to come out in this melody. They say, make a melody in your heart to the Lord. Uh, and make a melody in, uh, to the Lord in your heart. He says, listen, this melody, the melody that God really counts on, the melody that he loves, isn't the melody that comes out of our voice. It's not whether we can carry a tune or not. But it is the melody of our heart. The attitude of our heart as we're singing that he cares about. Now, I believe when we get to heaven, we're going to be wonderful singers. All of us will be. That's what I believe. But that doesn't mean you're a wonderful singer here or I am a wonderful singer here. But our melody out of our heart should be something that pleases God. You know, you can have the best voice, but if you don't have a thankful heart, you may be able to sing the most beautiful song, but you're only going to entertain people. But you're not going to really be worshiping God. And so God tells us to make a melody in our heart to him and then he has this and this is really hard for us those of you who've heard me uh, teach on thankfulness already know this it says but giving giving thanks always and for everything to god the father in the name of our lord jesus christ submitting to one another out of reverence for christ he says listen we need to give thanks always always give thanks no matter what the circumstances are, we already saw that you need to give thanks, but not only for every circumstance. He says, and for everything, whatever, not just the circumstances, but whatever is happening, whatever is going on in your life, whatever it is, you need to be thankful for that. Uh, and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, we are thankful to God, not just in every circumstance, but for everything that happens. That's where the rubber meets the road. You see, it's, it's, it's easy to be thankful when things, times are good. And it, it's actually relatively easy to be thankful even in bad circumstances. But here's what God says, no matter what happens, 
You need to be thankful for that. And you can argue with me all you want, but that's not what I'm saying. That's what God's saying here. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, that we defer to one another, but whatever the circumstances are, we're thankful in those circumstances, as we saw in 1 Thessalonians 5, but for everything, whatever it is, we need to be thankful. And that is so hard. I still struggle deeply with that. Thankfulness is God's will. The praise we sing is gratitude to God. And we need to give thanks for everything. Basically, giving thanks for everything, it really requires us to look at things from a different perspective. We need to... It, it's what we, we hear a lot in the world called the paradigm shift. A paradigm is the, the way you're looking at things. I'm looking at things from this perspective... But if I can't be thankful, what re what's required of me to be thankful for everything is a change in my perspective. First of all, we need to understand that God is sovereign. He's not taken surprise by any of the circumstances of our lives, nor is he taken su su by surprise for what is the, the things that are in our lives. He knows that already. So we really need to change our perspective. And when we change our perspective, we can then change our, our negatives into positives. And so we can take those things that we've never been thankful for and say I'm thankful for them. Listen, I haven't always done the right things. I, I have lived bad lives, uh, a bad life previously. I used to do all kinds of ungodly things. And... Do I regret it? Yes, I do. Would I change it if I could, though? I don't think I would. And I'm not saying that to encourage anyone to go out and just live an ungodly life. But what I, what I mean by that is God used all those things, the good and the bad in my life, to form me and make me into the man that I am today. I wouldn't be who I am without... Not just the circumstances of my life, but the events of my life. Do I regret some things? Yes. But if I changed them, I wouldn't be who I am today. And I believe that I am today much closer to the person that God wants me to be than what I was before. So here's some things. I just have a small list of things, some, some things that... If we have hearts that are thankful, some some negatives from this year that we can turn into positives. Uh, the coronavirus, the elephant in the room. You know, people are afraid of the coronavirus. How are we thankful for that? Well, this fear is something that opens the door of the gospel to, for us to share the gospel with other people. Are you taking advantage of the fear people have of coronavirus and death to, to share the gospel with them, to explain to them that God loves them, that, that God wants to save them, that Jesus died on the cross, was buried and rose on the third day to save them from their sins and so that they could have a relationship with God the Father? Uh, fear makes the lost more open to the gospel. COVID-19, the disease that's caused by coronavirus. Well, I can be thankful for that because God has preserved me from that so far. And I can be very thankful for that. And he's, he's preserved my family from that. Even though uh, some of my family have definitely been exposed to the virus, uh, they, didn't, they didn't get it. They didn't get COVID-19. I can be thankful for that. But even if I do get COVID-19, uh, even... If I do, I trust that God will preserve me. Well, you say, well, what if God doesn't preserve you? What if you die? Well, if he doesn't, then I'll be in heaven. And so even then, the virus served God's purpose to draw me home to him. And, and my problems are over then. So I can still be thankful. What about the death of family or friend? That's a hard one. And some are going to say, well, pastor, what, you know, you're going to hear what I say. 
And you're going to say, well, that's just really callous, Pastor. Uh, but may I say this? If your family member or friend who died, who passed away, was saved, you know, they're in heaven now. They're not suffering anymore. They're not diseased anymore. They're not, they're not arthritic anymore. They, if they had Alzheimer's or they don't have that anymore. If you have a family member who had some kind of disability or, you know, they, they're, they're cured. If they were saved, they're in heaven with Jesus Christ. And they're not feeling pain. They're not feeling sorrow. Well, what if they weren't saved? How can I be thankful that, that they died and they weren't saved? Well, that's a harder one. But the truth is that if they weren't saved, you know, they weren't saved, uh, it's, it's a hard thing. But, you know, the sin that they are paying for because they rejected Jesus Christ, that sin that they're paying for is actually less than what it would have been if they'd continued to live. And so there's less punishment for them, even though by their perspective, they may not understand that. You know, there, there's evidence in scripture that your sin is going to you pay, pay the penalty for your sin, which is horrendous. It's horrible. It's, it's eternal. It's eternity in, in the lake of fire. Uh, but there still seems to be levels of punishment and, and their punishment is going to be less than others. And, you know, uh, that's a hard thing. You know, you can be thankful if they are influencing others to ungodliness, that they're no longer here to influence them. If they were drawing you away from God, they're no longer here to draw you away from God and God preserved you, perhaps, through their deaths. And that's a hard thing. And some of you are probably going to be upset with me about it. But it's, it's a hard truth. What about the stay-at-home orders? How, is, how can we be thankful when we're forced to stay home? Well, if you were unemployed, uh, most of you receive $500 of unemployment extra every week. Which, quite frankly, was more than I make in a week. So, you know at my job so you know that's something to be thankful for you got that on top of unemployment so financially it wasn't necessarily a bad thing for you even though you might have been stuck at home for the most part and and bored uh you know if you're stuck at home if you if if you lost your jobs you're unemployed during that time uh you get to spend more time with your family and uh time is precious and I hope you made good use of that time. Uh, I know working at the Home Depot, uh, a lot of people took that time to do home improvement projects. And were you, you were able to do that, perhaps. Uh, perhaps you were able to, to work on a car to restore a car or something like that. Uh, and really, most importantly, you had time to get to know God better. Did you use that time wisely? to get to know God better, to, to study your Bible, to learn more. If you retained your job, well, you didn't have to sit around bored around the house like other people may have done. Uh, you got to keep your job. You know, some people still aren't back to work because their jobs, uh, maybe they opened up, but they didn't open up right away. And, and they didn't bring everyone back. And so some people are still out of jobs, but you got to keep your job. Uh, many, in many cases, uh, jobs increase pay. Some of these uh, major companies, uh, you know, there, there were bonuses for working during the pandemic, there, uh, during the, the height of the summer pandemic at least. There were pay raises that were given, whether they were temporary or, or permanent. And, and even, even if you didn't get that, you know, you had the opportunity to serve the needs of others. And that's really what God calls us to do. As Christians, we need to serve others and to, to be a light in this world. And you had the opportunity to do that as well. Well, what about the church shutdown? Well, I didn't like it any better than you did. 
Uh, but, you know, we were able to increase our testimony by, by honoring what the governor called us to do in limiting uh, gatherings. Uh, and, and our governor even then recognized that, it was, that the churches shouldn't be shut down and the churches were exempted from that and, and passed a law exempting churches from government shutdowns in the future. And, you know, but we expanded our ministry into this YouTube ministry, which, you know, my videos are not the most entertaining, perhaps, and they're never going to go viral, but the gospel's in them, and people will hear that, and maybe somebody will get saved. And if one person gets saved, that makes it all worthwhile. Something that we might not have had the opportunity to do uh, pre prior to this. And really, when people came back to church, it was very clear that they appreciated the church much more. And they appreciated uh, being with God's people much more. And so we can be thankful for that. The election. Well, <laughs> yeah, how do, we, how do we thank God uh, for this election season? <laughs> It's, it's been crazy. Well, the election is another opportunity to serve God by voting for the person who lines up with Scripture the most. You know, I will be the first person to admit that the major parties seem to always pick, re in the last few elections, the worst possible candidates. And, uh, but we can still evaluate those candidates, whether they're president, uh, Congress, Senate, uh, local, uh, national offices, whatever they are, we can evaluate them by scripture and look at how they line up with what the word of God says. And even if they're not Christians, we can vote for the one who takes the stance that line up best with the word of God. Uh, if your candidate won, hey, you won. Always a good time to, to praise God and be thankful when you win. Uh, you can also have the opportunity to demonstrate grace in winning. Uh, nobody likes a bad loser, but everybody hates a bad winner. And so so you can be gracious towards those who, who are upset that their candidate lost. And, and by being gracious, again, increase your opportunity to share the gospel and open a door to sharing the gospel with those people. Uh, if your candidate lost, well, you get to demonstrate grace in losing. And, uh, and you can thank God, even if your candidate lost it. You know what? The presidency is just for four years. At the end of four years, you get to vote again and and perhaps, you know, help people see if if the president is not doing a good job, is not keeping promises, is make, taking the wrong stands. Use these years to show people in scripture how this is wrong and, and maybe change their hearts and minds by the word of God. And maybe even see some people come to know Christ as Savior. Well, what about you know the Black Lives Matter riots and, and all that stuff? Well, uh, you can be part of the healing. And being part of the healing, again, you can magnify God. You can magnify Jesus Christ. You can share the gospel. And maybe some will get saved. You know, we may never have another revival in this country. But we can pray for revival in this country. Until God closes our country down permanently and America is no more, we still hope for revival. You know, how thankful are you this Thanksgiving? Are you thankful not just for the good things in your life, but the bad things in your life as well? The things that God has used to form you into the person that you are today. I hope that this Thanksgiving will be a Thanksgiving where you can really change your perspective and learn to give God the thanks and give God the glory, whether you like the circumstances and the events or not. May God richly bless you as you serve him, and I hope you have a wonderful, glorious Thanksgiving as you praise God. I have one final song. I haven't done this in a while, but I think it would be good to close this session with a song, Give Thanks.